जय राधा माधव कुंज बिहारी गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी पर गोपी जान बल्ला गिरी पर यशोद नंदान ब्रज जन रंजन यशोद नंदान ब्रज जन रंजन यमुन थेरा चारी यमुनथिरा वन चारी हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे 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 कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा 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 हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे नित्य गोर हरि बो हरि बो हरि बो नित्य गोर हरि बो जय जय प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद प्रभु पाद जय श्रील प्रभु पाद Premanande Hari Bo Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami Ti Namne Namaste Sarasati Devi Gauravani Pricharine Nirvishesha Shunyavadi Paschacha Deshatarine Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya 
Narayanam Namaskrityam Naram Chaiva Narottamam Daivim Sarasatim Vyasam Tato Jaya Mudirayat Nasta Praeshu Vabhadreshu Nityam Bhagavata Sevaya Bhagavati Uttama Shloke Bhakti Bhavati Nishtaki We're reading Srimad Bhagavatam, Canto 5, Chapter 15, beginning with text number 14 and 15, and then going on to 16, because there's no purport. Oh, yeah? Okay. Jinko bhi Hindi anuvaad chahiye, to Nadia Kumar Prabhu piche rahenge, aap unke saath bed sakte hai, aur anuvaad sun sakte hai. Can you want to read the, the prose for me? Yeah, that we can do. Yeah, we should read 14 and 15, and then we should read 16. Hamaj Skand 5 Adhyay 15, Jiska Sirsa Ka Raja Prirvat Ki Vansajo Ka Yas Varnam, in Slok Kramang 14, 15, or 16 Par Charcha Kar Rehe. 14 and 15 Ka Anwad Is Prakar Se Hai. Gayanti Ke Garb Se Maharaj Gaye Ke Teen Putra Huye, Jin Ke Naam Thhe Chitrarat, Sumati, Tatha Avarodhan. Chitrarat Ki Patni Urna Se Samrat Naam Ka Putra Prapta Hua, सम्राट की पत्नी का नाम उत्कला था जिसके गर्भ से सम्राट को मरीची नामक पुत्र का लाभ हुआ मरीची की पत्नी बिंदुमती से बिंदु नामक पुत्र हुआ बिंदु की पत्नी सरघा के गर्भ से मधु नामक एक पुत्र ने जन्म लिया मधु की पत्नी सुमना से वीरव्रत और वीरव्रत की पत्नी भोजा से मंथु तथा प्रमंथु नाम के दो पुत्र उत्पन्न हुए मंथु की पत्नी सत्या से भौमन नाम का पुत्र और भौमन की पत्नी दूषणा से त्वष्टा नामक पुत्र उत्पन्न हुआ त्वष्टा की पत्नी विरोचना से विरज नाम का पुत्र हुआ और उसकी पत्नी विसूची के गर्भ से एक सौ पुत्र तथा एक पुत्री उत्पन्न हुई इन सभी पुत्रों में सतजीत नाम का पुत्र सर्वोपरि था सोलवा श्लोक का अनुवाद इस प्रकार से है राजा विरज के संबंध में यह श्लोक प्रसिद्ध है जिसका अर्थ है अपने उच्च गुणों तथा व्यापक कीर्ति के कारण राजा विरज उसी प्रकार से प्रीव्रत राजा के वंश के मणि हो गए जिस प्रकार भगवान विष्णु अपनी दिव्य शक्ति द्वारा देवताओं को विशुभित विभूषित करते और उन्हें आशीष देते हैं तात्पर्य पुष्पित वृक्ष अपने सुगंधित फूलों के कारण उद्यान में अच्छी ख्याति अर्जित करता है इसी प्रकार यदि किसी वंश में कोई प्रसिद्ध व्यक्ति होता है तो उसकी उपमा वन के सुगंधित पुष्प से दी जाती है उसके कारण पूरा वंश इतिहास प्रसिद्ध हो सकता है चूंकि श्री कृष्ण ने यदुवंश में जन्म धारण किया अतः यदुवंश तथा यादव लोग सर्वदा के लिए विख्यात रहे राजा विरज के प्रकट होने से महाराज प्रियव्रत प्रियव्रत का वंश सदा से प्रसिद्ध रहा इस प्रकार श्रीमद् भागवतम के पंचम स्कंद के अंतर्गत राजा प्रियव्रत के वंशजों का यश वर्णन नामक पंद्रहवें अध्याय के भक्ति वेदान तात्पर्य पूर्ण हुए I have read. You have read already? Yeah. 16 or so? Yes. <laughs> okay. Om Magyana Timurandasya Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakturun Militanye Nath As my Shri Guru Venamaha Shri Chaitanya Manobhistam Sabitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupakadam Ayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Garo Shri Yata Padakamalam Shri Vaishnavamscha 
Shrirupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Raganathan Vitam Tam Sajevam Sadvaitam Sabadutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakanitam Scha Hey Krishna Karana Sindhu Dhina Bandhu Jagadpate Gopesha Gopika Kanta Radha Kanta Namastate Tapta Kanchana Gorange Radhe Vrindavanishwari Vrishabhanu Stute Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vancha Kaupata Rubyascha Kripa Sindhu Bhayevacha Patita nam pavan hebyo vaishnavibyo namo namaha jai shri krishna chaitanya prabhu nityananda shri advaita gadadhar shri vasade gor bhaktavinda hare krishna hare krishna 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 hare 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 rama hare rama Rama, Rama, Hare, Hare. So this is the last verse of this chapter, chapter 15. We're hearing about the descendants of Priyavrat. So I thought it might be helpful to just quickly review what's been covered in this fifth canto. It began with the activities of Maharaj Priyavrata himself. Maharaj Priyavrata being the eldest son of Swayambhuvamanu. Swayambhuvamanu had two sons, Uttanapad and Priyavrat. And, but Priyavrat, from the early age, gone off to be with Narada Muni, to gone, off, gone off to the mountains to do tapasya, and he didn't have interest. So Uttanapada took the throne when Swayambhuvamanu wanted to retire, Uttanapada became the king and he was ruling for a long time. But then, what happened then? Oh, well, <laughs> different people die, <laughs> they different die, they, they give up the body and, you know, Priyavrata still hadn't come back. They wanted, they went all the way to the Prachetas and the Prachetas were ruling and there was no descendant. And then he needed somebody to rule. So then Swayambhuvamanu, along with Brahma and Indra, they all came there and got Priyavrata to come back and to rule. And so Priyavrata entered into household and life. And uh, at the same time, he remembered the lotus feet of the Lord. He kept his devotion. You know, it's not necessarily true that Entering into family life means that you become degraded. There are many great devotees in household life. And Maharaj Priyavrata is certainly, he was certainly one of them. So then the next chapter, chapter 2, is about the son of Maharaj Priyavrata, Agnidra. Agnidra, he was the son. And he, we hear about his activities. And then after Agnidra, then comes Nabi, and from Nabi, then the son of Nabi, Rishabdev. And Lord Rishabdev is described there in his activities. Lord Rishabdev, of course, is like the, in the Jain religion, he's very prominent. He's like the Tirthakar, the first Tirthakar there in the Jain teachings. And Rishabdev is an incarnation of Lord Vishnu. He's described here about his activities. He's actually the Supreme Lord himself. So there's several chapters about Lord Rishavdev. And Lord Rishavdev had 100 sons. He was also in family life. And he had 100 sons. And his oldest son was a very great devotee, Maharaj Bharat. And that's described. Actually, he had other, all of his sons were really good, really good personality. There was the nine Prachetas, uh, not, not Prachetas, the nine Yogendras, Navyogendras, right? The, they were the sons of 
larger shaft dates, but you don't hear about them until 11th canto. And you'll hear about the nine Yugendra. They were all Mahabhagwat devotees and they traveled and preached. They just traveled and preached. Nine Yogendras, sons of Rishabdi. Bharat Maharaj, he was the oldest son. He became king. And this planet is called Bharat Vars after Bharat Maharaj, who was the son of Rishabdev. So we hear, after hearing about Rishabdev, then we hear about the activities of Bharat Maharaj and how Bharat Maharaj, how he, re after renouncing the kingdom, gave up everything, went to the Gan Ganduki, went to the Ganduki up there in Himalayas, and somehow he got in, attached to a deer, and he ended up becoming a deer in his next life. So that's described. And then you hear about how his next birth, after the birth as a deer, he became Jadbarat, and he was born the son of a Brahmana, and then you hear about his activities as Jadbarat, and particularly it's very in, important to hear about Jadbarat an encounter with Maharaj Rahugan. Maharaj Rahugan, uh, he was the, a king who was going to visit holy places, and he needed somebody to help carry his palanquin, and he happened to select Jadbarat to help carry his palanquin. So Jad Bharat was carrying his palanquin and <laughs> later in course of time because he was carrying the palanquin and avoiding the insects on the path. And so it was a rough ride for Maharaj Rahugan. And Maharaj Rahugan got quite angry at Jad Bharat and began to chastise him. And then Jad Bharat began to speak philosophically. And he revealed himself because Maharaj Rahugan thought that Jad Bharat was just some crazy person, just some useless person with no brain. But when he heard Jad Bharat speak, then he understood he was really a very great soul who was really enlightened. And so Maharaj Rahugan and Jad Bharat, they're discussing, you can hear the conversation between them. And Jad Bharat also describes the material world like a forest of enjoyment. So all of this is described here in Srimad Bhagavatam. And then that brings us up to the, this chapter which we're finishing today, which is chapter 15. We're hearing about the descents, the descendants of Priyavrata. And we were hearing particularly about Maharaj Gaya the last few days. And today they're talking about another Son, is, uh, what was the name? <laughs> Virajit. Uh, Virajit. Virajit, yes, yeah. So Virajit, one of the descendants of Priyavrata. And we'll go on to hear next chapter tomorrow, we'll hear beginning the description of Jambudweep. Because these kings were not ordinary kings. They were not just ruling this planet. They were ruling Jambudweep. They were really big kings, you know. Jambudweep. We don't even know about Jambudweep. We can't even dream of it, you know. It's beyond our comprehension. But they were ruling it. And the Pandavas sometimes like that, they would go there. When Arjuna was collecting gold for the Rajasuya sacrifice, he would go to these kind of places. So anyway, that's coming up in the next section of Srimad Bhagavatam. But today, we w want to speak in relation to the verse today, how there was a great soul, Virajit, appeared in this dynasty from Priyavrat. Although Priyavrat was a great soul himself, Vishwajit, it's also he's considered the jewel of the dynasty. We're not told exactly <laughs> very much about his activities. I couldn't find anything about him. But Prabhupada speaks about how you have one great soul in the dynasty, and it's what is very uh, one great soul brings so much credit to everybody in that dynasty, and. Prabhupada gives an example, just like you may have one sandalwood tree 
in the forest. If you have one sandalwood tree, the aroma of the sandalwood goes through the whole forest. And the whole forest becomes, you know, very aromatic due to the fragrance coming from the sandalwood tree. And Prabhupada gave this example, actually. We had uh, one devotee who joined in Hong Kong. One Chinese man joined in Hong Kong. When Burijan, His Grace Burijan of Prabhu, Burijan's very, very, very senior devotee, very learned devotee, and for some time he was preaching there in Hong Kong along with his wife. His good wife is also a very powerful preacher. She had been a, a movie actress before becoming a devotee, and she gave up being a movie actress to become devotee and to go out on Sankirtan. And Prabhupada arranged her marriage to Burijan and sent her off. She, she had joined in Los Angeles, but Prabhupada sent her to, to uh, Hong Kong to marry this one devotee, a man she'd never seen before. So it was really interesting, you know, that they were so renounced. Prabhupada arranged it, they did, and they're still married today, more than like 50 years, they're still married. And, and they're both very active in preaching. Anyway, Burijan recruited this one Chinese man in Hong Kong, and uh, he's still a devotee also, although he's in poor health and old age, but he's still devoted. So his name was Yashomati Sutta. And he began translation of the Bhagavad Gita into Chinese. And when Prabhupada heard that he'd actually translated Bhagavad Gita into Chinese, Prabhupada was so pleased. And Srila Prabhupada praised him. He said, you are a credit to all the Chinese race. He said, just like if you have one fragrant tree in the forest, the whole forest becomes glorified. Prabhupada said, because you have translated the Bhagavad Gita into the Chinese language, he said, you are a credit to all the Chinese people, to the whole race of China. And, and uh, it's very nice, actually, that Prabhupada appreciated so much that work. And uh, similarly, Prabhupada himself went to Moscow in 1971. At that time, Russia was very much communist, and it was really closed up. It was not Russia, it was all USSR. Today, you know, they're all divided, they're all separated states now. But in 1971, it was quite difficult to go there. But Prabhupada somehow, with the help of his secretary, Shamsundar Prabhu, he arranged that they could go there. And their, their purpose in going, they had arranged a meeting with a professor in the Moscow University, who was a professor of Asian studies, a professor Kotovsky. So Prabhupada and Shamsundar and I think uh, maybe uh, another devotee also had gone there with Prabhupada. And uh, they were just in Moscow for a few days. And they were looking around and seeing Moscow, how it was in those days. It was really very drab. And there were churches. Uh, you know, Russia have their own religion. They have a thing called the, the Russian Orthodox Church. And they have churches everywhere, all over Russia. So uh, when Prabhupada went there to Moscow, he saw that there were churches, but there were soldiers guarding the churches. Because the nature of the communist society, they don't encourage religion. So even though the people may want religion, the government doesn't want to encourage it. And then the Russians had posted these soldiers outside the, the door of the church just to restrict entry. Anyway, Sham Sundar was there with Prabhupada and difficult to get food. You know, Prabhupada wanted some fruit or vegetables, <laughs> some rice, and very difficult to find these things. 
So Shamsundar Prabhu was out searching to buy some rice so he could, uh, they could cook something for Prabhupada. So while he was out there in the streets, there was one, there was an Indian boy who his father was like working in the Indian embassy and he was with a, a young Russian man. And they saw Shamsundar and they could see that he was a Westerner. And so they asked him, do you have any Beatles music? <laughs> do you know Beatles? Do you remember them? Yeah. Huh? Yeah, right, you know, the, the music group, they were very, very popular in 1971. So Russia, they're not allowed these kind of things, you know, that's not allowed, wasn't allowed in the communist regime. They don't want to encourage these kind of things. So they, they approached Shamsundar and asked, could you give us some, have you got any Beatles music with you you could give us? And Shamsundar looked at them and said, he said, well, you know, I've got the, the guru of the Beatles with me here right here. <laughs> the guru of the Beatles is here right now. He's sitting in the hotel room. You want to come and meet him? So they said, oh, yeah, sure, you know. <laughs> so they went over to the hotel room and they met Srila Prabhupada. And this young Russian man was so interested you know, Prabhupada began to speak and explain a little bit about self-realization and God, -real God consciousness. And this Russian young man, he immediately took to it and he had so, so many questions. And he, he spent a lot of time there with Prabhupada, just hearing Prabhupada and asking questions and learning from him. And that young Russian man, Srila Prabhupada initiated him, Ananta, Sat, Ananta Shanti, Ananta Shanti. Yeah, he, he died of some years ago, but uh, this Ananta Shanti was the first Prabhupada's disciple in Russia, and he was so affected by Prabhupada's association that he took the message of Krishna consciousness around Russia that he personally helped to bring more Russian people into Krishna consciousness. And they even organized the printing of Prabhupada's books and translation of Prabhupada's books, which were illegal. It was illegal. Just like in China, you can't, legal is very difficult to print books the, because they know the power of the press. And Prabhupada himself said about how in, in India, in Calcutta, for example, they have the books of the communist philosophy. There's a bookstore there which is com all for communist books. And just simply through these books, the Russians had put some books, they brought some books there in English language, they brought some books there to... Calcutta, and they made a little bookstore, and they were distributing these books about the communist philosophy, Marxism, and Leninism, and this and that ism. And from that, they introduced communism to India. That's how it came in India. It, no Russians came here to preach communism. How did communism get here in India? that you had Bengal, it was communist state for many years, decades. And uh, maybe Kerala is still communist, I don't know. But <clears throat> it came, how did it come into India? Simply by their books. And Prabhupada gave this example, he said in the same way, he said, we may not be able to go to some countries like at, at Russia, going into Russia at that time was difficult. He said, but send the books. And the devotees then, they really worked hard to send the books into Russia. And th there's a book written about it. Uh, what's it called? Bread? So salted bread, right. Salted bread. Yeah, you can read a wonderful book describing about the, all the tortures and the difficulties, the struggles which they had in trying to bring Krishna consciousness into Russia. 
But we do have a, a number of centers in Russia. We're not a major group in Russia. We're a minority group, but we do have a lot of very nice devotees. And actually, when you go outside of Russia, when you go to America, you go to London, you go different countries, you'll see there's a lot of Russian devotees. And they do a lot of service. So Prabhupada was the one who introduced Krishna consciousness to Russia. With the help of Shamsundar, they met this one man. And Prabhupada said, Prabhupada gave the example, he said, just like when you cook rice, you pick up one grain, and if one grain is cooked, you know all the rice is cooked, right? So everybody who cooks, you know that, right? And so the same way Prabhupada said, this one man shows what is the mood in Russia. From this one man, you can understand how ripe this country is to introduce Krishna consciousness. And of course, Prabhupada sent some of his senior devotees told them that they should preach there in Russia. And there were people, Gopal Krishna Maharaj, of course, he goes there regularly. He has many disciples there. And there are many, many other devotees. Indra Jumna Swami, of course, he also has a lot of Russian disciples. He travels regularly there. And then uh, Niranjan Maharaj also is very active there. And Krishna Shetra Maharaj, very active. Many, many very senior devotees, they're doing wonderful preaching there in Russia. And we, we get good response. Many people, young people, coming to Krishna consciousness. Not only young, old people also. Everyone, they, many people, they really like Krishna consciousness movement. But there's opposition. There's always opposition. Prabhupada writes about this in the Chaitanya Charitamrita. And he describes how when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was present in Mayapur, how the Chankasi came and broke the Madanga drum in the house of Srivas Pandit and stopped the, stopped the Sankirtan. No more Sankirtan. Any more Sankirtan, I will convert all of you to Muslims. So they were very afraid. So Prabhupada writes in that section of the Chaitanya Charitamrita, he said, where there is opposition to our movement, he said, this shows that our movement is bona fide. <laughs> because we're doing something good. We're presenting something very good, very powerful. So naturally, the materialistic people who are more atheistic, they oppose it and they try to stop it. And so... We always face these challenges in preaching. You have to expect there will be challenges. Even Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati, when he was preaching in, in, in Bengal and Orissa and these places, there was opposition. There was opposition to him. At one point, they even stoned. Their, their, uh, they were doing parikrama, and at one point, they all got stoned. There was, there was so many, and there were threats on the life of Bhaktisiddhanta Sarasati. And Prabhupada also said so much opposition. He said in Mom, Bom, Mo, Bombay or Mumbai, he said the opposition was from the municipality. <laughs> at that time, Prabhupada was trying to build the temple at Juhu, and the municipality were opposing because of some influence by the man who had cheated, tried to cheat us in purchasing the land. So Prabhupada said the municipality are, are opposition. He said in Navadweep the opposition is my god brothers. <laughs> and he said in Vrindavan the opposition are the pundits. <laughs> he said, you, you have to expect people will oppose you. You try to preach Krishna consciousness, it will be opposition. But wherever there, Yatra Yogeshwaro Parto, Yatra Parturdan, Tatra Sri Vijayo Bhuti, Dhruvan Nitirma Tirman. Wherever there is Krishna and Arjun, there will be victory, morality, extraordinary power, and opulence. So we have to be determined when we face 
opposition, when we face difficulties, we have to have faith to go on and to fight and have faith that we can come out victorious because wherever there is Krishna, there will be victory. So we have faith in the, the, that Krishna is there to help us. So just one person can make such a big difference to the whole country. This one Russian boy became a devotee, such a big difference. He could introduce Krishna consciousness to so many people. At one point, the KGB, which is the secret police in Russia, very powerful. The KGB said there are three threats to, the, to, our, Russia, to our country. And the three threats were, uh, it was uh, the, the Beatles, I think, with the rock. The Beatles with the rock, the pop music. And then the other thing was huh? Coca-Cola. And the third thing was Hare Krishna. Yeah, Coca-Cola. So these things, they, they, you know, they, they felt these are the threats to their regime. But of course, Prabhupada knew, Prabhupada told us, he said, because he, Prabhupada had told Tamal Krishna Maharaj he should go to China. Tamal Krishna Maharaj had come back to America and he was preaching in America and he was working with, a, he had a party called Radha Damodar and he had many buses and devotees all traveling and distributing books all over America. But there was some tension between the temples and the, the, this traveling party. Because in those days, you know, our movement, our temples were all supported by book distribution. So if somebody could distribute books, he was a very valuable man. <laughs> you know, you really wanted him to be in your temple because he's bringing income for the temple. So, it's very, you know, we didn't have congregations. There was no big Indian communities in America in Prabhupada's time. And the temples were all young Westerners. So how to support the temples? We were distributing books every day. And the books would make a little profit and that would go to maintain the temples. So Tamal Krishna Maharaj was running the Radha Damodar Sankirtan party and they were giving all their profits to the BBT, which would forward the money to India to develop the preaching in India because Srila Prabhupada was building the Vrindavan temple and the Juhu temple and also trying to develop Mayapur. So he wanted money. And so he said, that, um, you, Mary, yes, they sh they, he said, India was the lame man and America was the blind man, right? The lame man and the blind man together, they help each other. So he said, American, the American temples, they should help the Indian temples. At that time, 1970s, India was a different place. So money was coming from America. But there was a lot of pressure. Give more. <laughs> you have to give more. Who's giving the most? Oh, you're great. You're really a big temple. You're the best temple. And who's distributing the, big, the most books? Oh, he's very famous, you know, big book distributor. There was even one devotee, he would distribute so many books. Prabhupada said he is an incarnation of book distribution. <laughs> and he's a very prominent, he, he unfortunately separated himself from Iskon, but he's still preaching. And he has his own disciples, he has his own temples. He's a very, <laughs> he's a very uh, dynamic person, you know. Yeah. Anyway, Prabhupada's an incarnation of book distribution. <laughs> <laughs> he could distribute books very, very, uh, he could get anyone to take a book, you know. So anyway, Tamal Krishna Maharaj was trying to run these buses and he would try to recruit the, you know, men, young men, you know, <laughs> get the young men to join the bus. Now, usually they would go to colleges and they'd get the young men to come out of the universities, give up the college and join Krishna consciousness. They're fed up studying anyway, you know. 
why waste their time, you know, go and travel with the devotees, have a good time. So he recruited many people, but some temples would complain because sometimes young men in the temple, they would become restless. That if you just stay in the temple, oh, I'd rather go on the bus with all the sannyasis and travel, it will be more exciting. So some of the young men who were in the temples would leave the temple and go and join the Radhadamadar parties. And that created a little tension between, between the temple presidents who were trying to maintain the temples and the Radhadamadar Sankirtan party, which was brahmacharis and sannyasis, <laughs> right? So, uh, so the temple presidents complained to Prabhupada and Prabhupada didn't like it. So he told Tamal Krishna Maharaj, he said, this is not good. He said, you have to stop this. You, and Prabhupada gave some conditions and some restrictions. And Tamal Krishna Maharaj said, oh, Prabhupada, he said, I might as well go to China. And Prabhupada said, oh, yes, very good idea. <laughs> you go to China. <laughs> and said, no, Prabhupada, please. <laughs> He really didn't want to go to China, you know. He said, no, Prabhupada, please, please. He said, you go to China or else you go to Mayapur, just sit and chant Hare Krishna. <laughs> Don't do anything else. Like that. So Prabhupada gave him the ultimatum, you see. So he was supposed to go to China. For some time, lasted. Later on, of course, he became Prabhupada's secretary and he was serving Srila Prabhupada the final year. Before Prabhupada departed, he was personally taking care of Srila Prabhupada constantly. And he did wonderful service for Srila Prabhupada. And after Prabhupada departed, then he had to consider about the instructions which Prabhupada had given him. And so Prabhupada had told him, you know, that you, support, you should go to China. So he thought about it. And so he came to Hong Kong and he tried to he developed Hong Kong. At, at, the, at that time, there was nothing much there in Hong Kong, but he came to Hong Kong and he got people to put some money in there and to support it. And he developed the temple there and recruited some Chinese people. And then also, he got the more and more books translated to Chinese. And we tried to send the books into China and we'd send books into China. In those days, in 1970s and 80s, the Chinese people were coming to Hong Kong to work. Nowadays, it's a different way. Hong Kong people go to China to work. <laughs> Although, not, maybe not with the COVID, but uh, and up until COVID, it was like that. The industry is in China. It moved out of Hong Kong to China. But in the 1970s and 80s, Chinese people were all coming to Hong Kong, and they were working in Hong Kong. So when it came to things like Chinese New Year, they would all go back to their home in China. So we would all go to the train station, and we'd give out books to people. We'd give out Chinese books to them to take back to China. And in this way, we'd send the books into China. And similarly, the devotees, you know, Germany was divided Eastern Europe, Western Europe, and, you know, and they would send the books. Somehow they would smuggle books. They would find ways to smuggle the books into the Eastern part of Europe, into Russia and into all these Ukraine, all these places. They would smuggle books. They put books everywhere, put them in, in on, on ships. They'd, they'd just put wherever they could. They just try to get these books somehow in, into Russia. And I know uh, we distributed the books in China. And, you know, the, we had the experience. One man got the book and he saw the book and he loved it so much. He, he came to us. He said, I want to help you spread this knowledge all over China. He, he was so he was a Buddhist man actually, so he believed in reincarnation and and he and he was a vegetarian, so he liked very much our books and 
he tried his best to help us and he's still he's still alive and he's still he's still very friendly with us now he's a buddhist monk but whenever we have programs he will come and he's very nice he always speaks very favorably about krishna consciousness so you can see the effect you distribute books you know it, it really works it really affects people another young man he got the book and he was picking out sections from the book and he would copy it out and he got big pieces of paper and he'd write up different sections from our books. He'd write it and paste it on his wall. We went to his house. His house was covered with <laughs> big, you know, sections from Prabhupada's book. He stuck them up on the wall. It's so nice to see how much people really appreciate Prabhupada's books. You, you know, Prabhupada said, in the future, because we were struggling to distribute books, but Prabhupada told us, he said, in the future, people will line up to get your books. And actually, it, it happened. Not only in countries like Russia and China, but even in America sometimes, people would line up to purchase Prabhupada's books. We'd go to these colleges in the USA, and they, they have these places in the USA. The college is like a city, just huge, you know, and it's full. The campus, the whole campus, so many buildings and hostels and so many students staying there and so many shops and everything. And so you go there, sometimes we'd go there and distribute books and people would just come and line up to get Prabhupada's books. They were so eager. They appreciated so much like Bhagavad Gita, Krishna book. So Prabhupada actually understood these things. He understood the importance of pre distributing his books. And he, th this, he, said, th he told to Mal Krishna Maharaj, he said, even you can't go into China, he said at the present moment, he said, just send the books there and the books will do the work. The books will create the field for the preaching. And we actually see it, that the books do. They, they created the... And he told us also, he said, he said, this communist thing is not going to last forever. And we see in Russia how it, it's broken up. Now Russia is much more open. It's still difficulties. It's still difficult. There's still challenges. But still, it's much better than it used to be. And now we do have devotees, many centers there, and preaching is going on. So this is really how Krishna consciousness works. Just You don't need a lot of people, you just need one sincere soul. We, there's a saying that one moon is better than millions of stars, right? You may have millions of stars in the sky, but you don't get a lot of light. But if you have one moon, that one moon that can benefit the whole planet. And so like that, one devotee, one pure devotee can change the face of the earth. And we see how much Srila Prabhupada changed the face of the earth just by his preaching, by his determined effort at the end of his life how he dedicated 10 years at the end of his life to introducing Krishna consciousness. And there are so many more devotees coming in the future. More and more people will come and take up Krishna consciousness. So we give great importance to the young children. The young children, I was just in... Uh, in, in uh, Bangalore, and in Bangalore, there was one couple, the, the, one of their young sons, he recites the whole Vishnu Sahasranam. <laughs> of course, we don't recite Vishnu Sahasranam, really, ourselves. Why? <laughs> because we just chant the name of Ram, right? You don't need to chant Vishnu Sahasranam. Uh, one name of Ram is equal to the whole Vishnu Sahasranam. But anyway, this family, their 
they're devotees in Krishna consciousness, and they're, they're also from Madhva line. So their son learned the whole Vishnu Sahasranam, and he was only six years old. And so it, they, it got in the Guinness Book of Records. Six, the youngest child to recite the whole Vishnu Sahasranam at age of six. So like that, we've got promising devotees coming up. I saw yesterday going to the Gurukula, the young children there, the young people there, and, and certainly it's very encouraging, very promising to see these young people take up Krishna consciousness. So we are sure in the future there will be many wonderful devotees to help us to spread this Krishna consciousness. We don't need a lot of people. We, we just need pure souls. One pure soul can do everything. Just like it's described here, that one soul is a jewel. It said Haridas Thakur is like the jewel of the Godiyas. Because Haridas Thakur chanted so much the holy name. He had so much faith in the holy name. So he's like the jewel. And so there's so many jewels in Krishna consciousness, in the parampara. We want to understand more their mood and their mission and appreciate them. And then we can also propagate Krishna consciousness. We'll have more faith and we'll become more enthused to propagate Krishna consciousness and to follow, try to follow in their footsteps, to follow their example. Okay, are there any question, any comment? Anyone? Uh, Prabhupada uh, found everywhere, uh, especially on foreign lands, uh, difficulty in spreading our case and uh, such that rigid uh, nations like Russia and Chinese, they are whole, uh, we can say there are there are where isms, communism and that type of that things, we, where it was even uh, the arrow or uh, any bird cannot uh, go inside. In such situation, still they they made a successful not only break that isms and spread a uh, case and make the whole world, uh, the people over there who were ignorant, uh, innocent and ignorant, and uh, so that's why they become knowledgeable and uh, have the nectar of case. So as a, that uh, we can say, as a squirrel, on uh, that lowest level, how if one pure person who is uh, following all this uh, purity and uh, chastity, vegetarian and uh, all that, uh, these uh, our four, um, principles, but still many a times because uh, in our this, uh, especially Maharashtra, uh, I'm uh, basically I'm a teacher, so uh, the people or, or the small pupils also were uh, uh, diluted by tobacco and that good cut type, and it is very difficult to give moral and uh, spread uh, um, that values of uh, religion is very secul secular. But through morality, how can we, uh, the teachers, can spread a religion uh, or that a uh, KC is my... Through mor morality? How can morality, yes. Yeah. Yes, it's certainly unfortunate that India became secular. <laughs> that happened also in USA. In America, they used to have prayer every day. It was the, the custom that every day in the classroom, they would begin the day with prayer. But one politician, one lady politician, said, oh, this is not good, we're indoctrinating people into our belief, we shouldn't impose our belief on others, and everyone should, has a right to decide for themselves. 
And so they all agreed, they had no more prayer. And that was the end of prayer in the classroom, unfortunately. And so your concern is you want to encourage morality among the school children and how to help them. Well, the parents have a lot to do with it, you see, the home in which they're born in and the upbringing which they have, that's very important. If they can have a, if they're born in a home where the parents are more religious and pious, then it's a bit easier for them. If you have children who are brought up in a, like a, a one parent home, you know, maybe the child is brought up with the mother, the mother's separated from the husband, and maybe she has a boyfriend or something. Well, these kind of things go on. And so the, the child is aware of this, you know. Oh, oh, they say, somebody said to me one time, they said, oh yeah, my, my mother, she goes out with other men. My father also goes out with other women. You know? So you, if you're brought up in that kind of environment, then it's not good. It's very unf very difficult for children to understand the importance of morality. So how to somehow get through to them? We're trying. Education is very important. We do want to educate people about values, values of life, and that's going on. The one devotee in Delhi, he is published some books on it, and he does do a lot of courses, and I think devotees are also here in Nasik, they're also doing, they're trying to teach values. It takes a lot of patience and a lot of uh, enthusiasm. We have to think also how to introduce this to a manner to attract people, how to attract people into these things. Sometimes, you know, in places like USA, if you try to speak to people about morality, they just laugh at you, you know, they think, what? What? what's wrong with you, you know? <laughs> they, they just can't follow, they can't uh, accept it at all. It's just something so far away from them, the thought of mor moral principles. And there was even a case, you know, one Indian family who lived there in America, so their daughter was going to school, and so it happened that another boy at the school, he invited her, hey, let's go out together, you know, I'll take you out. And so she said to her mother, is it all right <laughs> for me to go out with him? And fortunately, the mother said to the daughter, she said, if you go with that boy, you're no longer my daughter. So that's the kind of stance sometimes you have to take like that. You have to really be very determined and, and very serious to let people know the importance of this, these kind of values. Moral principles are, are something really important in life and they will certainly uh, if we don't have that kind of morality, then we're certainly living a hellish life and we'll go to hell. That will be the destiny. So it is important for us to try to teach these things, but to teach them in a manner in which somehow to make it attractive and appealing to people. We do want to speak about the dangers which are there in immorality. What happens? What kind of society does it lead to? What, what is the future of people who are engaged in all kinds of immoral activities? How they suffer the agonies. So, of course, we don't just want to make it all what we, the Christians call hell and brimstone preaching. You know, if, if you only speak about the miseries and the suffering which you undergo, then it, it won't be so effective. But if we can speak about the joy and the happiness which comes 
by practicing a moral life, that it's much more pleasing and satisfying, and that you will have a much happier life by practicing moral, mor moral principles. The mind will be more peaceful. You can be more stable in your family life. People who are not moral, then all the time so much disturbance in the home. And there's always the threat of divorce. You don't know how long the home will stay together. But people who are practicing moral principles, they can live peacefully and happily. They don't think, they don't, they didn't, we don't even consider that. There's no consideration of divorce. Marriage means no divorce. And Srila Prabhupada would often imp impress that on devotees entering into family life. He said that you're getting married, now you are lifetime companions. Lifetime companions. That should be understood with the marriage. But it's not understood unfortunately, by a lot of people today. So it is important for people to hear things like, you know, Ramlila, <laughs> Ramayana, and these kind of Mahabharata, these things, sometimes they help. And gradually bring in the Krishna conscious philosophy. So teaching is a very challenging profession and certainly as a teacher you have the highest, the greatest responsibility. I remember teachers at my school, they would often say, don't smoke. But the students would say, but sir, you smoke. <laughs> you know? And so that kind of teaching is no good, you know. You want to teach to people, you have to teach by example. And so Prabhupada writes about that, that the teachers, the heads of state, the heads of family, they all have that responsibility to show the example, to set the standards by their example, exemplary behavior. Okay. Thank you for that, Hare Krishna. Okay. Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai. We're back to Vrindy.